This is so exciting to me, Easter. I just love Easter so much. And I love it for a lot of reasons that's really, um, that's just really, really important. But before I, I say that, I, I want to know how many people really love peeps that come out this time of year? Talk about the sweets, right, David? The peeps. The peeps are like heroin to me. I eat one, I eat the whole thing. I can't stop with them. And um, so I just like, I, I hate it. They're right by the cash register everywhere I go. And it's like, I really dislike that. My dog, my chocolate lab dog, Mandy, she likes peeps too. She likes the real ones that you get from Columbia Tractor that crawl around in the ground first. So you get her two or three of those and she just gulps them right down. No, I'm just kidding. I would never do that. I was just, I would never do that. Peeps, little chicken. You can buy them at Columbia Tractor in a box. Little chickens, they go peep, peep, peep. And they walk around and... Dogs like that, but I would never do that. But Easter is such a cool time for, I mean, like everybody thinks Christmas is like the best, you know, because we make such a huge holiday out of it and Jesus was born. But everybody kind of had to take, take Joseph and Mary's word for the fact that he was, born, he was born from a virgin woman. There's no proof of that. We have nothing to say about it. We just say, well, that's the way it is. And a lot of people don't believe that. But Easter's different. Because Easter can be scientifically proven to be true. And that's what Jesus, really, the reason why he came, we talk about him dying for us and taking our sins to the cross, but there's another reason why he came, and that was to show the power, the supernatural power of God on the face of the earth. And from the very first time he started in ministry, he started doing miracles, Things that people could not explain. From the very first thing he did, he was at a wedding, they ran out of wine, he'd take, give me some water. He turns the water into wine. It's really, really cool. Nobody could account for it. How did this happen? And you know what? This wine he made is better than the rest of the wine we ever had before. He started with miracles. And he just went on and on with miracles. Let me just, here's what I tell you what the dictionary says what a miracle is. It's an effect or an extraordinary event in the physical world that surpasses all known or natural powers and is ascribed to only a supernatural cause. That's what a miracle is. People look at it and they cannot figure it out. There's no natural reason for that to happen. And Jesus, one of his main reasons come is to prove God's existence through miracles. It's really, really cool. Just a week before Jesus died and rose again, he raised Lazarus from the tomb. He was purposely late to get to Lazarus. He purposely late not to heal him before he died. He gets there three days after he's in the tomb. He's all wrapped up. How many people know how the total number of pe- people Jesus raised from the dead besides Lazarus? See, there was three that came before Lazarus because he said to Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. Okay, sorry. So, so he raised Lazarus from the dead, and they couldn't explain it. And that's why when he came into Jerusalem, like they were all excited. The crowds were like super excited. Like there's no explanation for that. The guy was in a tomb for three days, and he raised him from the dead. And now they're like, what is this? What is going on? So now they're coming into Jerusalem with him. And it's a huge, huge thing. And that's why this, when this whole thing happened, the world was turned upside down. We started a calendar based on when this happened. Thousands and thousands of people just suddenly said, okay, this is it, this is real, I'm following him. Peter goes out and preaches a little thing, and thousands of people, and when I say thousands, remember, thousands of people was a lot of people back then. There wasn't a city of a million people. When a thousand people got saved, half the city got saved. But man is so short-sighted We are so short-sighted that we forget things that happened 10 years ago, 100 years ago. I saw a cartoon in the paper just this week about all the terrorist attacks, and this guy listed all the terrorist attacks that's occurred in like the last five years, and he left out 9-11. It's only been 15 years. Left it out. We forgot already. We're so short-sighted. A huge miracle like this happens, and then 10 years goes by, 100 years goes by, 1,000 years goes by, and now we don't even remember it happened. Imagine if that just took place, like this week. The world would be turned upside down, but we forget so quickly. And yet after all of these years, 2,016 years later, 
theologians, historians, and scientists still can't explain what happened when you put all the facts together. They still can't explain it. It's never been disproved by science. It's never been. I'm going to tell you how important it is. Jesus rising from the dead proves that all of the other religions on the face of the world besides Christianity is false. I know we try to be tolerant, we try to be welcoming, and, you know, but a lot of people come out and say, if you believe in God, that's all you have to do. That's all you have to do. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say, I am a way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You either accept that he rose from the dead and went to be with the Father, or you're not getting there. It separates everything. It's huge. It's so important. God made certain that certain scientific evidence was present there. And those are the, I'm going to quickly, Reader's Digest version, because that's what I do best. Reader's Digest version. I'm going to take something. You, we could spend, we could make a college course out of this and take a year. We're going to do this in about 10 minutes. I, I know how to make things brief, maybe, maybe. Maybe. My family doesn't say that. They say I talk too much. But anyway, um, here are some of the facts relevant to the resurrection. Jesus, this is a background of what we're going to say really quickly. Jesus of Nazareth, a Jewish prophet who claimed to be the Christ, prophesied about in the Jewish scriptures, was arrested. He was judged a political criminal, and he was crucified. Three days after his death and his burial, some women went to his tomb. They found the body gone. In subsequent weeks, his disciples claimed that God raised him from the dead and that he appeared to them various times before ascending into heaven. From that foundation, Christianity spread through the Roman Empire and continued to exert great influence down through the centuries. Okay, that's what history says happens. But now let me explain to you a few facts quickly of some things that make it amazing to me. This was the clincher in my life. Here's a famous historian. His name is E.M. Bailock. He's a kind of a historian. Tommy has a degree in history. He's a kind of historian that everybody in the world recognizes this guy knows his stuff. And he said, I claim to be an historian. My approach to classics is historical. I tell you that the evidence for the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ is better authenticated than most of the facts of ancient history. Okay, so you ready for the facts? Real quick facts. You ready? Yes. Number one, there were no less than 500 living witnesses of people seeing him after he was resurrected. No less than 500 people saw him. 30 years later, when Paul was writing one of the books, he goes, if you don't believe me, why don't you ask some of the people that saw him? 500 people saw him after he rose from the dead. Now, wait a minute. You say, well, that's not that really scientific. What's scientific about it to me is that dozens of those 500 people were beheaded for saying they saw him. And not one of them said, no, wait, I did. Don't do that. Now, now one person gave in. Seeing Christ was so astonishing in their life that they would rather be beheaded than deny it. That, to me, has a pretty big stamp on it. Number two, a lot of people don't know this one. It's in Matthew. It's in Matthew. If you want to put it up on the board, Sean, you can do that. Matthew 27, verse 66. The Roman Empire put a seal on the tomb. They put a seal on that tomb. We, we skip over the scripture because we don't know what it really means, but in the Roman Empire, when they said something and they said, we're going to put a seal on it, that seal meant death to anybody that broke it. Like, not just death. Like, they would strip you. They would tie you upside down to a stake. They would put your clothes underneath you and light you on fire with your own clothes. If, and that's in history, if you broke one of their seals without permission. I don't know exactly what that seal looked like. I didn't get into the you know, college course study of this, but they put a seal on that tomb and on, on that stone to make sure that it wasn't broken unless the Romans themselves broke it. 
The, way, the guy that I wrote, read about this said that the, the Roman Empire would send out what would be like the FBI and the CIA after your case to figure out what happened and you're going to die. He said it was a huge thing for them. They really didn't have anything else to go by. This was their thing. It was broken. And they never knew who did it. Number three, of course, we talk about this all the time. The tomb was empty. They go in there and the tomb is empty. They searched through his body to this day, 2016 years later, they're searching still on to find his body because if they can find it, they can prove that Christianity is false. The Roman Empire, knowing that their, their seal was broken and their guards were gone, had been looking for his body. The Jews looked for the body. Again, they all say the disciples stole the body. All these disciples were beheaded and refused to say anything other than he rose from the dead. Number four. This is one of my favorites. We know that the tomb, the stone, was removed from the entrance of the tomb. The seal was on it. The stone was moved. But we probably don't know that the stone is estimated, depending upon what it was actually made out of, to be anywhere from one and a half to two tons heavy. Please remember, they did not have machinery back then to handle this. They didn't know we had a forklift on the scene. Imagine if each strong man could pick up 100 pounds, and if something weighed two tons, which is 4,000 pounds, you would need, okay, say, no, you don't have to pick it up, we're just going to roll it. That's the really cool thing. Just make sure I don't have this on the wrong spot. Yep. Here's the real cool thing about it. The scriptures say, and historians have it, it is declared that the stone wasn't just rolled away from the tomb. It appeared that the stone was actually picked up and moved uphill away from the tomb. When they arrived at it, they didn't find it just moved over a foot so somebody could squeeze in and out of the tomb. They found that it had been moved slightly uphill and away from the tomb. A two-ton rock. Yeah, the disciples are going to come along and somehow they're going to sneak around the guards and somehow they're going to disembark the seal and somehow they're going to pick up a stone and move it and sneak in and out with the Lord's body. It's scientifically un impossible. There's no explanation for it. None. The stone was moved. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Number five, the Roman guards went AWOL. The Roman guards went AWOL. One historian, let me just let me put it this way. This is, what, this is what this historian wrote. The Roman guards left. They left their place of responsibility. How can their attrition be explained when Roman military discipline was so exceptional? Justin, in Digest number 49, a famous story book, mentions all of the offenses that required the death penalty. The fear of their superior's wrath and the possibility of death meant they paid close attention to the minutest details of their jobs. One way in which a guard was put to death is by being stripped of his clothes and being burned alive in a fire with his own garments. If it was not apparent which soldier had failed in his duty, then lots were drawn to see which one would be punished with death for the guard's unit's failure. Certainly the entire unit would not have fallen asleep with that kind of threat over their heads. Dr. George Curry, a student of Roman military discipline, wrote that the fear of punishment produced flawless attention to duty, especially in night watches. And yet, the guards were not to be found. They're gone. Well, they're gone because the Bible says that the angel came and did this stuff, and they know their lives are in jeopardy. They're gone. Never to be found. Number six, we're almost done. I know everybody's got Easter meals to go to. Ham, lasagna, probably... My wife has anything to do with it. I'm sure there'd be a dozen other things included in there. So, you know, speaking of that, yes, thank you, since you brought it up, there was a record set in my house Saturday night, uh, Friday night, 
There was a record set in my house Friday night. We had Ben over for dinner, you know, so Ben ate dinner. He already had cutlets and Parmesan. It was really good. And then about 8 o'clock, Josie came over to, uh, you know, play some cards with us and so forth. And then Linda offered, like, offered Josie some cutlets. <laughs> and Josie said, I just ate. And she goes, I'll put them on the table anyway, <laughs> which is her habit. That's what Italian mothers do. They feed you whether you're hungry or not. And she put a, I'm going to estimate 50 cutlets on a plate, cutlets, you know, chicken, bread, you know, cutlets, 50 of them. And they, you know, Josie had one, and then Ben had one, and then Josie had another one, and then Ben, and then this look came over their faces. Like all these endorphins started flowing through their brain. And then they, and then they, they like, and they like started competing with each other. And Linda and I started laughing hysterically. They looked like a couple of sharks that just come across a bloody fish in the water. They couldn't tear the meat off that plate fast enough. And both saying, we just ate, we just ate, we're not hungry. <laughs> Gone. Ten minutes later, the plate was empty. You guys are good. You guys are good. Adam, you just wish you were there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, I'm sorry. Number six. I HD, HD, I'm so easily distracted. Number six, grave clothes. Grave clothes. This is not something often talked about. This is really important, grave clothes. You're going to go in and steal a body. You're going to take the time to unwrap it. You're going to grab the body and run. When they went in to the grave, to the empty tomb, they found the entire grave clothes thing set out. One historian said it looked like it was all in one piece except slightly indented, like the body was still in it. That's how the grave clothes were. Like, who would do that? Who would so carefully make sure to unwrap it and all the sense and everything? It was all right there, still sitting right where they laid them. The grave clothes were still there. Number seven. Last one. Some people argue that the witnesses to whom Jesus appeared to were all friendly witnesses. But that's not true. One very common one we know that wasn't friendly to Jesus at all was Paul. If there was an opponent to Christ and his disciples, it was Paul. He made sure, he went around to make sure that the Christians were beheaded. And Jesus appeared to them. I'm not even going to cover all the theories that, that have arisen of people trying to explain it and really, because they're really silly. They're really stupid. One guy tried to say, well, they all went to the wrong tomb. Well, the other tombs didn't have a Roman seal on them and Roman guards in front of them. How could, how could more than one party go to the wrong tomb? It's so silly. Other person said that, said that the, everybody involved had, was hallucinating. On what? And the guards, why would the guards be hallucinating? Their life is at stake. Somebody else said the theory is Jesus never died, he just fainted. And he was in a really bad place from all the torture he went through and he's very weak and, and so he, he never really died. So then he woke up in the tomb and rolled a two-ton stone away from it and broke the seal and, you know, and managed to have the guards you know, look the other way. I mean, it's like, come on. And of course, then there's the famous one, the body was stolen. But with all that was involved with the Roman Empire and the Jews, don't forget, the religion of the day wanted to find that body so bad. And it's been 2016 years. And so, there you have it. It's an undeniable thing. When the musicians come back up. It's an undeniable thing that happened. Science can't explain it. But guess what humankind does? We say, well, that happened 2,000 years ago, so it's not really important anymore. Really? It's still there. It still happened. And it's still true. And if it is true, what does that mean for you? What does it mean for me? Are we just going to live our life like we always do? Or are we going to say, wait a minute, Jesus came for a purpose. I think I better figure out what my purpose is in Him. That's what it means. Then the change occurred. The disciples suddenly became, instead of being these people of fear, they suddenly went out because they found this is what it's all about. And they suddenly became purposed in their life to do God's will 
and their life. I am wondering, why, isn't the sh- why has the shaking stopped in the world from this event? But then I'm starting to look and say, maybe the shaking is starting to occur again. Maybe the earth is starting to shake right now. Man, when I look around, I have never seen things so bad. Maybe the shaking is starting now. Maybe it's time for the world to revisit where did this thing. And maybe it's time for all of us to confront ourselves with the fact Jesus really did rise from the dead. He really is alive. He really is the way, the truth, and the life. Where are you going to be with that? If you're here and you say, you know what? That's it. I'm living my life for Christ. Just come on up and get prayer. Just come on up and let somebody pray for you. It is so cool. I believe that that ray of God, of Jesus himself, wants to touch you today and to come into your hearts.